Welcome back to Take One. This is your host, Juan Pablo Sa, and this is part four of everything I watched at VIF. If you've missed parts one to three, there is a playlist right here with every single part in this series, so you can click it if you want. But now, on with the video. On October 6th, the next day of VIF, I watched one movie, but before that, I went to an event called An Evening with Michael Abels. For those of you who don't know, Michael Abels is the legendary composer who wrote genre-defying scores for all three of Jordan Peele's films. These are, of course, Get Out, Us, and Nope, and this event was absolutely incredible. Michael Abels talked about his creative process, he told us about the inspiration behind the music, and he also told us about conversations he had with Jordan Peele that were very, very interesting. On top of that, he even told us what the mysterious words that can be heard at the beginning of the Get Out score actually mean, and that was really freaking cool. So yeah, an evening with Michael Abels was an amazing experience, and I just wanted to thank my friend Isa for getting me to this event for free. Thank you so much. That being said, the one movie that I saw right after an evening with Michael Abels was RMN. RMN is a drama about a man who returns to his small Transylvanian village a few days before Christmas. This is a Romanian film written and directed by Christian Monaghew, who, for those of you who don't know, he directed one of the most disturbing movies I've ever seen. That movie is four months, three weeks, and two days, and that film is extremely hard to watch, extremely unsettling, but also, it is a pretty amazing film. Considering that, I was very excited for RMN, but I also was a bit hesitant. I didn't know what I was going into, and I was afraid that it was going to be just as fucked up as, you know, his previous films. That said, I'm very happy to let you all know that I thought RMN was great. It is not as disturbing as four months, three weeks, and two days, but it is still a bit unsettling. At its essence, this movie is an exploration of racism and how it can transform into mass hysteria if left unchecked. In the small town where this movie is set, racist sentiments grow out of proportion and snowball uncontrollably until there's no way back. If I'm being honest, I believe this movie did an excellent job of showing that behind racism and exclusion, there is nothing but pathetic fear. A fear that is oftentimes unfounded and one that would disappear if people truly took the time to get to know each other. Now, apart from what I already mentioned, I also wanted to say that I love this film's setting. And the reason why I love it so much is because I think it's a great idea to have a story about racism and exclusion being said during Christmas. You know, after all, Christmas is a holiday that is all about empathy and inclusivity. But here in this film, the stark contrast between what the holiday is meant to be and what it actually is, it packs a heavy punch. Now, something else that I have to mention is actually my favorite part of the entire film. And that is a scene that features a very heated discussion that includes almost everyone in town. In this scene, residents share their opinions of what they believe should happen to the foreigners that have come to their town. And this scene is amazing, not only because this discussion is extremely intense and painfully realistic, but what makes this scene truly exceptional is that all of this, all of that discussion is captured in one single uninterrupted shot. This is a scene that goes on for 15 minutes and it is captured in just one shot. I can't even begin to comprehend the amount of work that must have gone behind this single one scene. That said, it paid off because it is absolutely incredible. On top of that, the last thing that I would like to mention is the film's ending. This film's ending is incredible and very, very memorable. It is very confusing, it is very enigmatic, but I mean that in the best way possible. I'm not gonna give anything away, but all I will say is that I am still thinking about that ending to this day and I am still struggling to understand what the hell it meant. So in conclusion, when it comes to RMN, I would give it an 8 out of 10 because I thought this movie was great. Now, on the next day of VIF, October 7, I rested, and this was very much needed at this point. That said, just the next day, in October 8, I went back to VIF to watch the last two movies I would watch in the entire film festival, and the first one of these films was Broker. Broker is a heartfelt drama about a pair of men who run an illegal business as baby brokers. They try to sell off an abandoned baby, are later joined by the baby's mother, and throughout the movie end up becoming their own found family. This is a South Korean film directed by Hirokazu Kurita, and this is the same guy who directed Shoplifters, by the way, a movie that I very much enjoy, and I thought this film, I thought Broker was really, really beautiful. There is not much I can say about the film because the story is quite simple, but I really freaking loved it. The characters are charming and complex, the movie's full of some very emotional moments, and I really love the questions that this film asks in regards to morality and ethics. 
In real life, there is no such thing as an absolutely good or an absolutely evil person. We are all just people who sometimes make mistakes and sometimes make things that we can be proud of. And that is something that is beautifully reflected in this film. Even though this film's characters do some questionable stuff, we always understand where they're coming from and we even question if what they're doing is truly that wrong. Now, on top of that, I also love the dilemma that this film poses in regards to prevention and instigation and how these things could be mutually related. In this movie, there are boxes all throughout the city that women can use anonymously to get rid of their babies if they don't want them anymore. Looking after these boxes, of course, there's a group of people who's in charge of taking care of the babies and taking them to orphanages, but this film poses a very interesting question in regards to these boxes, you know? These boxes were created as a way to prevent women from getting rid of babies in unsafe ways. But just because they exist, are these boxes actually incentivizing women to act rashly and get rid of their babies with little to no consideration? This is what I mean by the fact that this movie operates in a weird gray area that is difficult to define. These baby boxes are meant to be a good thing, but they could also be causing a bad thing simultaneously. So in conclusion, Broker was charming, heart-wrenching, incredibly moving, and yet another movie about found families from director Hirokazu Kurita, but that's fine by me because I absolutely love them. If I were to give this film a score in between 1 to 10, I would give it a 9 out of 10 because I thought this film was amazing. Now, the second movie that I watched on October 8th and the very last movie that I saw in the 41st edition of the Vancouver International Film Festival was EO. EO is a movie about a donkey. Yes, EO follows a donkey as he encounters good and bad people and experiences joy and pain in many different scenarios. This is a Polish movie directed by Jerzy Skolimowski and I thought this movie was good. And the first thing I'll say is that coming into this movie, I was very, very intrigued. I was intrigued, first of all, because it is not very often that you see a live-action movie with an animal for its protagonist, much less a donkey, but also because I sort of wanted to know what EO meant. Turns out, EO is the name of the donkey, and it is also an onomatopoeia for the sound that donkeys make. So yeah, as I said, EO is good. It is very artsy, it is a bit inaccessible, but I thought it was fine. My main critique of the film is that I thought the movie was a bit too repetitive, you know? I know that the entire film is just meant to be a donkey meeting different people in different places, but after this happens three or four times, it just starts becoming stale, predictable, and very, very repetitive. Also, not a critique, but I was also very surprised to find out what this movie was really about. I thought this movie was just going to be about a donkey meeting different human beings and how humans are good or bad depending on you know who they are and where they come from. But no, in the second half of this movie, it became very clear that this is actually a movie about animal cruelty. As a result, some scenes in this film are very hard to watch, especially because the donkey is so freaking cute. But yeah, all in all, EO was a good movie with some important commentary, a very cute donkey, and a story that ended up becoming a bit too repetitive. My score for EO is a 6 out of 10, which means I thought it was good. And that is everything I watched at the 41st edition of the Vancouver International Film Festival. But now, before I wrap this up, I will go on to tell you my ranking of all 15 movies I saw at this year's VIV. Starting with number 15, Rabia Kurnas vs. George W. Bush, a film that in my opinion was an absolute tonal mess. Then in number 14, we have EO, the movie about the donkey, which was good but repetitive. Then at number 13, I have Empire of Light, which is honestly one of the most disappointing films I've seen all year but was still sort of good because of Olivia Colman's great performance. Then at number 12, I have Bones of Crows, a very important film with some very important commentary, but all in all, the narrative was a huge, huge mess. Then at number 11, I have Corsage, which is a very good film, but it's a bit forgettable. At number 10, I have Women Talking, a very good movie from Sarah Pauly with some great performances, but that at the end of the day felt a bit anticlimactic. Then at number 9, I have Close, a truly beautiful film that you know, I just really freaking loved. Then at number eight, I have The Sun, a movie that apparently everyone hates except for me, but what can I say? I thought it was great. Then at number seven, I have RMN, the movie with the 15 minute long shot that really, really impressed me. Then at number six, I have Triangle of Sadness, a movie that I think its first two acts are absolutely incredible, but it sadly loses its steam in the third act. Then at number five, I have Broker, a beautiful, beautiful film that was able to pull in my heartstrings in unprecedented ways. Then at number four, I have Decision to Leave, a neo-noir that, you know, completely captured my attention and I'm still thinking about to this day. Then at number three, I have The Whale, the film with the single greatest performance I've seen this year and one of the best performances of all time with Brendan Fraser. 
Then, at number two, I have After Sun, a movie that I haven't been able to stop thinking since I saw it, and it just keeps getting better and better every time that I think about it. And then, at number one, my favorite film of the entire film festival has to be The Banshees of Inisherin, an absolute masterpiece. And now, before we end this, I just want to thank once again everyone at VIF for inviting us to cover the 41st edition of the Vancouver International Film Festival as members of the press. It was a great experience, we had a lot of fun, and from the bottom of my heart, it truly means a lot. We would also like to thank everyone at MPMG Arts Marketing for getting us so many cool interviews and opportunities, but specifically, we would like to thank Jacob Woik, Caterina Capisano, Laura Murray, Ines Mean, Angela Venater, and Angela Poon for all your help and support. Thank you so, so much. This was the first time we covered the Vancouver International Film Festival, and you all made sure our experience was truly, truly special. Ooh.